America is still at war. The 50-year campaign that has entirely reshaped American politics, society, and the economy as we know it. The war on drugs. America's public enemy number one in the United States is drug abuse. Drugs are menacing our society. They're threatening our values and undercutting our institutions. They're killing our children. Who's responsible? Let me tell you straight out. Everyone who uses drugs, everyone who sells drugs, and everyone who looks the other way. They were to literally eradicate all of the social, uh, economic, uh, and health ills associated by drugs and drug abuse. Uh, and so it doesn't get much more ambitious than that. It spanned multiple administrations and led to the creation of a dedicated federal agency. Law enforcement was given an unprecedented level of authority with measures like mandatory sentencing and no-knock warrants. 40 years in prison. That's what our total sentence was, with no chance of parole. And since 1971, America has spent over a trillion dollars enforcing drug policies. Yet, when it comes to whether it was a success, most experts agree. The drug war is a failed policy. The things that they said that would happen, people would stop using drugs, communities would get back together, we'd be safer, they'd get drugs off the street. Those things didn't happen. Not only did it not accomplish its primary objective, but it also generated all kinds of highly counterproductive effects. Now that 50 years have passed since the start of the battle, did the US win the war on drugs? What was the true goal? And was it successful? President Richard Nixon launched the war on drugs in June of 1971. In order to fight and defeat this enemy, it is necessary to wage a new all-out offensive. President Reagan continued the battle during his administration. Tonight, I can report to you that we've made much progress. And by next year, our spending for drug law enforcement will have more than tripled from its 1981 levels. This. This is crack cocaine, seized a few days ago by drug enforcement agents in a park just across the street from the White House. No one among us is out of harm's way. This is your brain. And this is heroin. This is what happens to your brain after snorting heroin. Any questions? Claiming victory in the war on drugs has been notoriously elusive for everyone from presidents to media strategists because it's difficult to agree on how exactly to define success. Whether the United States has won the war on drugs is really a matter of whom you ask. Policymakers who have an interest in either defending their past investments in the war on drugs or in perpetuating it or expanding it, oftentimes say that it's been successful. It's been successful in, in stopping the importation of drugs into the United States, uh, and that it has been successful in terms of preventing access to those drugs. Supporters of the initiative often referred to a steep decline in illicit drug use between 1979 and 2000. At its peak in 1979, 14.1% of Americans 12 years or older admitted to using illicit drugs in the past month. By 1999, that number had dropped by nearly half to just 6.7%. Certainly aspects of the war on drugs has worked. Some drugs have been prevented from coming into the United States. By making things illegal, you raise the price of the product that's illegal, and so that has certainly prevented access for some people. But all of that has changed in recent years. Drug use in the United States is climbing again, and more quickly than ever. In 2019, the number of illicit drug users rose back to 13% of Americans 12 years or older, nearly reaching its peak from 40 years ago. If the goal of the war on drugs was to decrease drug usage and prevent drug-related deaths, it hasn't made much progress. We are still in the midst of the most devastating drug epidemic in US history. Last year, probably 90,000 Americans died as a result of drug overdose. The federal government is spending more money than ever to enforce drug policies. In 1981, the federal budget for drug abuse prevention and control was just over a billion dollars. By 2020, 
That number had grown to 34.6 billion, over a thousand percent increase when adjusted for inflation. Just take the DEA for instance. In 47 years, the Drug Enforcement Administration grew from a small organization with just under 3,000 employees and a $65 million budget to a massive agency that employs more than 10,000 employees with a budget of $3.1 billion. According to the White House, the national drug control budget is estimated to hit a historic level of $41 billion by 2022. In the overall scheme of how much the U.S. government spends, uh, it's not a huge amount. The bigger issue is that there's a burden from an economic perspective, because when you make something illegal, it has a series of consequences uh, that, that affect all areas of life. For instance, there, there's the foregone use of resources, that $50 billion that is going into combating drugs cannot be used on other things. Uh, it can't be used on education. It can't be used on health care. Uh, it can't be kept by taxpayers who ultimately have to foot the bill for these things. The true cost of the war on drugs goes far beyond the budget of enforcement. Over the years, drug policy has drastically transformed the U.S. criminal justice system. The war on drugs has resulted in mass incarceration primarily as a result of the draconian sentencing laws that the war on drugs has brought about, primarily mandatory minimum sentences, where it doesn't matter the role of the person uh, in the offense. All that matters is the amount of drugs. Sentencing should be based on the role of the person in the offense. And it's so frightening, you know, and devastating, because you in there on a so-called draconian sentence, it appears no way out. Of the almost 2.3 million people currently incarcerated in the United States, one in five are locked up for a drug offense. Many users will not stop using in prison, which is the predominant motivation for uh, incarcerating people. And uh, once they are released from prison, they might also return to use. And in fact, their use might be even more compounded by the risks of overdose. In 2019 alone, Law enforcement made over 1.5 million arrests related to drug violations. And while more arrests might seem like a success on the surface, it doesn't quite paint the whole picture. It's hard, it's tough. You know, when you first went to prison, no one wanted to hear your story because they felt that you were more or less just fabricating something. And you're guilty of such. And you deserve to be where you are. That was hurtful and painful. The other really important aspect of this, and then this shifts us into a discussion of some of the, the social costs, is that people that are arrested for drugs and then convicted uh, have a record. Uh, and that record uh, stays with them, uh, often for their entire life. And that can have real consequences on things like educational opportunities, for things like uh, employment opportunities and so on. And so those economic costs those costs in terms of lost productivity are significant. It's also important to note that there are six times as many arrests for drug possession as for drug sales, a gap that has been increasing over time. In 2018, for instance, 40% of drug arrests were due to marijuana, but 92% of those arrests were made for possession. The conversation about the war on drugs and our investment in the criminalization has always been around this idea that if we arrest people, we are going to get the bad guy. We are gonna get the kingpin. And what data has shown us for the last five decades is that that's not who we're getting. We're getting people who use drugs, we're getting low level subsistence sellers. We're not getting any of the boogeymen that the government created. Well, a lot of it has to do with the, the skewed mentality of law enforcement and prosecutors that if they arrest the low level person, that they will tell on or inform the higher level people. What you got in prison primarily is users. Because what happened is, in a great many of the cases, the users don't have the information that the prosecutors want and need. So they cut deals. And so what happened is, the users, the little one, ends up getting the kingpin sentence. Mass incarceration leaves a heavy burden on both the federal and state government's budgets. It costs an average of about $37,500 annually to host an inmate in federal correctional facilities, 
while cities like New York have spent up to 447,000 per inmate. It's estimated that mass incarceration costs the United States $182 billion every year, according to the Prison Policy Initiative. Most of the drug use imprisonment takes place at the state level, not at the federal level. And states found their budgets enormously strapped by having to put funds toward correctional facilities that grew into enormous complex. And one unfortunate way is that states dealt with it was uh, privatizing correction, something that's a specific feature to the United States that has been a very problematic and fraught policy, partially driven by the tendency to arrest nonviolent drug offenders. There's also a massive racial disparity when it comes to drug incarcerations. Nearly 80% of the people in federal prison and almost 60% of the people in state prison for drug offenses are Black or Latino. In 2019, despite making up just 13.4% of the U.S. population, Black people made up more than a quarter of the drug-related arrests. And meanwhile, in 2019, more white American adults reported using illicit drugs at some point in their life than Black American adults. You look around, you know, all you see the people of color, everybody recognized that. Even uh, the staff, though, their staffs would even say the same thing. So that is really what has had a large part in fueling what we now call today mass incarceration, which has also been called the new Jim Crow. So how exactly can we fix the war on drugs? Is it winnable? Many experts agree that the U.S. is on the right path by changing the national attitude to a strategy of decriminalization. If you decriminalize drugs, if you made them legal, on the supply side, the profit that is attached to drugs now that are illegal, the extra normal or super normal profit would be reduced, which would automatically remove many of the problems that people point out in terms of violence with the drug cartels and so on. On the demand side, you would remove the stigma that is attached with using drugs and the stigma that is attached with being an addict. I feel that the decriminalization of marijuana is one big step towards the end of mandatory minimum of sentences, particularly in the federal system. People incarcerated for marijuana offenses were disproportionate to even all other drugs in the system. In the spring of 2021, New York became the 15th state, along with the District of Columbia, to legalize marijuana for recreational use. Oregon, in February, became the first state to decriminalize the possession of any small amount of drugs. I think decriminalization is a bold step forward. It's about recognizing that 50 years ago, we decided to use a criminal justice approach. And decriminalization would mean that we would be retracting from that approach. However, some experts warn that decriminalization is a tricky balancing act. It's, in my view, a, a good policy overall, but one that needs to be carefully worked out. It's generating violence in the drug markets in a way that the city didn't see before. And it's also generating visible drug use that is often deeply troubling for surrounding communities. So how one goes about uh, decriminalization, what policy it's coupled with, what kind of assistance to users, what kind of enforcement policies are all very important dimensions. The allocation of budget is another area that needs attention. For a long time, the U.S. has spent the majority of its budget in supply reduction, that is punishing and eradicating the use of drugs through means of criminal justice, rather than demand reduction that involves education, prevention, and treating people who use drugs. What we need in terms of fixing this issue, dealing with the war on drugs, is not to pour more money and resources into fighting uh, a war that we can never win, but rather putting resources into what I call transformative change. It doesn't take that type of punishment in order to deter a person. Many of the ones shouldn't be in there, don't deserve to be in there. If anything, there's ones that deserve to be in a drug rehab center, a drug treatment center. In 2016, the Obama administration, for the first time in the modern war on drugs, allocated more funding in treatment and prevention than law enforcement. The Biden administration in 2021 has allocated a little over $5.3 billion more on reducing demand over reducing supply. It's a move in the right direction, but there's still lots more work to be done. We could put that money in 
um, actually bolstering drug education across the country that's based in science as opposed to stigma. The money we spent on the enforcement of drugs is futile because it's not actually making us safer. And it's actually, it's, it's criminalizing communities, but it's also making us less safe because we don't have money for the things that would actually help us. Will these changes really lead to a victory in the war on drugs? Probably not. America's battle against illicit substances is an ongoing one, and it's most likely here to stay. All of these vested interests want to expand the amount of money that's spent combating drugs. And so from that standpoint, I, I see more of the same. I don't think the war on drugs is going anywhere anytime soon as a political program and as a political talking point.